welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, part of the Department of Business, Economic Development, Tourism, State of Hawaii. It's hard to get all that out at once. But anyway, thanks for being here on the show today. Uh, we're going to be talking microgrids, which is probably after hydrogen, my second most favorite thing to talk about. And uh, today we've got a, a great guest, uh, a gentleman that I work with quite a bit um, here in Honolulu on the projects we're doing at Hickam. And um, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Hickam, but I want to actually talk about bigger grids in general for, to start with. But I got Mr. Ryan Wilmans from Burns McDonald. McDonald, not McDonald. McDonald. Yep. No D at the end. No. no McDonald's burgers. Not making burgers, but okay. we make plenty of other stuff. And he's, a, he's an electrical engineer from, engineer from Burns McDonald. And uh, he's one of the key guys that we work with to do our microgrids at Hickam. So welcome to the show. Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, glad to have you here. Can you tell the audience a little bit about you know how you got started doing what you're doing and what, what lights your fire about being an electrical engineer? Sure, sure. I've been uh, in the electrical business my whole life. My family had an electrical contracting business, so I grew up uh, watching projects just get built, whether it be in my neighborhood and around my house. I uh, started working for my dad and became an electrician. Uh, back in Iowa growing up, so I'm still a journeyman electrician to this day. I just loved electrical that much. I went on to Iowa State to be an electrical engineer, and I found my way to Burns McDonald uh, via that path. I work on a lot of projects the last seven or eight years with Burns McDonald on large industrial electrical upgrades when an industrial client wants to build a new unit or retrofit an existing unit. Mm -hmm all of the new systems are becoming a lot more smarter, a lot more control and information that's being passed. And electrically, we're starting to get pushed to do that as well, just uh, to match up with the capabilities of a process. Mm -hmm. So doing that with Burns McDonald on projects everywhere from, a, from an ice cream plant to a, an export facility on the Gulf Coast, I see a lot of different uh, capabilities electrically. When we start to talk microgrids, Electrically, we want to have the information, the control, and uh, that di distribution knowledge, not just um, from the industrial client side, but within the microgrid. So bringing in me and some other players into that microgrid group, we can start to pull knowledge from these other industries that have those capabilities. So that's what uh, found me into working with you guys on the, on the microgrid today. And how long have you been on island here? I've been on island for oh, about eight months or so, okay. nine months. Still working on my tan. It's, it yep. hasn't quite come in quite yet. <laughs> and what, are you getting into hiking or surfing or anything too? Yeah, my wife and I love to hike, and so we're always out getting some getting dirty somewhere with our muddy shoes um, on the weekends, and then we love getting in the water. Terrific. And oh, I was going to say, and you like to you like to have a green egg too sometime, and uh, I heard you and Dave Mullen there were talking about. It. We can cook smoking, some pretty good food, yeah. Smoking some ribs and stuff. Absolutely. We'll have to make okay. some ribs sometime and, and try that out. Okay. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things that you've, I mean, you obviously have a background for it. When, when you look at the islands here, especially Honolulu and the challenges that Hawaiian Electric has in absorbing more and more renewable, because as you know, 2045, they're expecting us to be 100% renewable on the grid. And if we're going to do the same thing or something like it with transportation, that even means more electricity uh, required for the transportation sector. What are some of the challenges that HECO faces as we get more photovoltaic and wind power coming up on the grid? Yeah, that's a good question. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hit them harder than uh, just about anybody else. When I got the call about the Hawaii and the microgrid, and they say, well, the grid's changing so fast in Hawaii to meet this 100% uh, renewable state. This is where an electrical engineer wants to be to uh, join in on that activity because it is hard. They have to deal with with a lot of changes from their traditional, what I'll call spinning assets, like a, a diesel generator perhaps, or a natural gas what has that, that inertia that spins. It helps keep the grid very stable. Uh, solar voltaic doesn't have any of that inertia. They have to almost synthetically build it. So you get a different stability question when it comes to the overall grid. When a cloud comes over or the wind isn't as strong, HECO has their, their ways of telling the future, we'll say, or going mm -hmm. into the, to see that cloud coming up, but you can't ever really know what that's going to impact on your system. Right. An engine, you can ramp down and ramp up. When the cloud hits and you lose that power, it's got to be made up instantaneously right somewhere else. The neat thing about a, an electrical market is 
Whenever I have a demand, I have to have supply. Mm -hmm. It's not like a grocery store where I can stock up on a bunch of spaghetti until it needs to go away. It needs to happen instantly. Mm -hmm. And solar and wind aren't going to tell you when they're going to drop out. Mm -hmm. So it creates a stability question as the more and more of that potential drop or even the potential gain happens, the utility has to make up for that. Okay, so it would seem that the, the larger the grid overall, and the more intermittent renewables you have on there, the more complex the problem is. Yep, absolutely. The, when you have that potential for a drop in solar and you just keep stacking it up to more and more and more solar, that, that's going to accumulate. So one of the ways that I know HECO is looking to handle that issue is to put storage out there. And traditionally we think of storage as batteries or something you know like batteries. But what are some of the other options for storing energy that can help the electric company balance those loads more rapidly um, when you have a cloud come over and the wind drops off suddenly? Sure, uh, one of the easiest ways to, to not store it, but even to just handle it, is just turn it off mm -hmm. and just say, I don't want to use you because because you're not doing what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a very poor use of energy because you're not using it at that point. So when you, when you talk about battery storage, that's one option. And uh, hydrogen storage, is, as you've talked about on the show, many times before is an option as well to produce hydrogen as a as almost like a buffer so as you you get that intermittent energy you're going to take maybe the base load that you know you're going to get and I'll put that on the hydrogen side but uh, take that fluctuating part and just create as much hydrogen as you can at that time mm -hmm. there's some other methods of energy storage out there something um, a lot I'd say a little more traditional would be a pumped hydro mm -hmm. you, you pump water up up a hill and you gain that potential energy as you move water up and then release the water back down to convert that stored energy back into electrical, well, mechanical, then electrical. Don't really have that uh, case here because you, you need a very large mass to, to store that water and then you need the high elevation, elevation change yeah. and we, we're just not that high being at sea level. So. Yeah, that formula is important is the volume you can get and the delta in the height. Yep. Those are the two big pieces of that equation that give you your power. So, you know, Hawaii, we're, we're looking at probably a lot, of in, a lot of intermittent renewables on the grid. And, you know, for me, I'm a hydrogen guy, so I see that, that formula, like you say, where you take uh, as much solar as you can use as a base load, and maybe the fluctuating part, you just take whatever you get and make the hydrogen off of that and store it, and maybe even use it for the, the uh, energy sector on the transportation side sell the hydrogen for fuel cell vehicles or turn it back into hydrogen you can put back on the grid. Well, one of the other issues that, that Hawaiian Electric has to deal with is they're pushing power through long lines all over the island. So you have that main Kahi power plant and the one in Pearl City, uh, maybe a few more spots, but it, it gets pushed out through lines and through, trans, uh, through um, substations and transformers. And it gets ramped up and ramped down before it ever gets to somebody's house. And those things cause um, you to lose energy along the way uh, and actually waste energy. So when you, when you start looking at microgrids, is, is there potential for us to maybe island parts of our island um, so that they're easier to manage? Where maybe Campbell Industrial Park or downtown Honolulu, you're, you're going to need a, a bigger base load. Mm -hmm. But maybe some smaller, less, less or more stable that maybe they only get five or or, or ten percent change in their in their spikes, versus a big industrial area. We might have big motors going off and on all the time. It, would that be a kind of a great place to do some of this um, islanding and experimenting with microgrids? Yeah, absolutely. The first the comment that I'll try to respond to is the moving power over distances. In Hawaii, from an electrical aspect, we. We might think it's far because it takes us two hours to get to the other side of the island, but some of these power lines might not be quite so far. But in any case, as we move power from A to B, there's an efficiency loss there. There's a voltage drop. And any time we do that, they're actually, we're losing power just for being on the line. Uh, in the mainland, they have the same problem with really long transmission lines. They'll, they'll raise the voltage up really high to try and minimize those. The story with microgrids starts to marry up kind of well with the reason why we start talking microgrids starts to match up really well with solving that problem because microgrids really started to gain some traction as just distributed generation lowers in cost. So mm -hmm. solar is, is constantly driving down cost on, on an annual right. basis. And mainland, the, the lowering cost of natural gas and natural gas generators 
starts to intrigue some clients to produce their own power. When you get individual users putting on their own distributed generation, they don't take the hit for that efficiency drop that you see that uh, a utility will mm -hmm. will um, Because take of the off. long lines. Because of the long lines, yeah. So right where I'm making the power, I'm using it. So right. I gained some efficiency right there on top of the lowering cost of the actual distributed generation. Mm -hmm. When I have these, I'll say assets, these generation abilities, if I create my infrastructure in a way to start microgridding, now I can start to actually help out the utility from that standpoint of, of distributing that generation. Now there have to be a, a handshake between how that energy is used because sometimes in HECO will, will change their generation assets to the most efficient possible uh, cost at any time. That's, mm -hmm. that's their goal is to, to drive down that cost as well as keep up the stability. And a microgrid takes that same philosophy and just makes it a lot smaller. More manageable. Yep. Okay. And the new technology that we have, I mean, do the, the new switches or computers or, I mean, the new technology, does it even help that process more? So if you, if you could take, like, communities and island them where they have, number one, a more stable load to begin with, and number two, really good switch gear now and, and good computers and good control systems, you know, is it getting more and more realistic and more and more cost effective to look at certain parts of the island and say maybe HECO should should look at, you know, taking those those communities and helping them not stay on the grid but stay connected and island themselves more often. Yeah. Is that reasonable? Yeah, it really is. And the components that we're using today have a lot more capabilities, uh, not just from a microgrid standpoint. I would say even microgrids are taking from we'll call the, the smart grid industry or an industrial client who has a high level of automation. So when we talk about a microgrid, we have the same issues as, as the macro grid, the grid tight or the HECO with stability and control. When we shrink it down, we don't necessarily have all the same parts, pieces, uh, engineer and maintenance crew that, that mm -hmm. HECO would have. But the existing electrical equipment that we're used to using is getting smarter and more capable. So we, we might install a little bit different piece of equipment that's a lot more capable and then add the controls to it. And now we start to make our own, that's how we start to make our microgrid. Mm -hmm. We pull the functions and some of the equipment that smart grid applications have, and then we pull some of the different applications that we pull from our mm -hmm. power generation, and then from the industrial clients with uh, their smart controls. Kind of wrap all that into to one control system, and we're using the equipment from each of those sectors to to supplement that. Okay, so. So, in theory, we could have an island, in, a couple island in parts of our community, maybe Waianae and Milavani and maybe Hawaii Kai or something like that, Nuuanu, a couple of communities. When, when those islanded um, um, grids, microgrids, have to connect and disconnect back to HECO, how, does, how is that reasonably handled from an electrical perspective, electrical engineer's perspective? Sure. Right now, uh, the grid does that in in some fashion with uh, their their smart closing and reclosing. When you start to add your distributed generation, that's where it starts to get a little more complex than our, our conventional centralized model, I'll say. So if you wanted to section off a city and have them be their own microgrid, decoupling as long as they have their own generation Up and, and stability, they can they can stay running decoupled. Mm -hmm. You just come off and say. Hey, um, utility, work on your stuff and then let me know when I can come back and, and help you out or you help me. But I'm going to worry about me for right now. And that might just be in its own city, as long as they have the generation and the control. Connecting back, you need, it's not as simple as um, you're basically just throwing a light switch, yeah, right? Because yeah. the way the power is alternating, you need to make sure that you are in sync with the, the utility before you close that in. Otherwise, it's quite damaging to the, the equipment on either side. So there, there's some extra parts and pieces or control, I'll say, some smarts that we need to put in at that point mm -hmm. where we're going to couple and decouple. For a city, it's a little bit trickier because they have to negotiate how they're going to work financially bef when they decouple. Mm -hmm. um, for an individual client or, a, a, let's say, a community, that discussion is a little bit easier. So there's a, a financial, political piece to it as oh, well. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, we'll be back with Ryan in a few seconds to talk some more about some of the challenges that ECO has and some of the things that maybe we could try doing with microgrids. Thank 
you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here, and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on my lunch hour. Hey, we actually have a studio audience today, so I'd like to thank all the members of our studio audience for being here and being good cheerleaders for us. So Ryan, we we're talking about microgrids and, and you know all things microgrid, but uh, let's talk a little bit, about, not about just connecting with HECO, but how maybe different islanded communities could, could talk to each other first and maybe help uh, stabilize all of that before they reconnect. How would that work? Yeah, absolutely. So as we start to build individual microgrids, maybe it's a community of houses that, that wants to have their own distribution and their ability to microgrid themselves. Uh, maybe it's Pearl or a military base. Um, maybe it's a large city block. That could start to cause a little bit of an issue with HECO because they, they want to have an understanding of where that load and generation capability is. When you start to, let's say we have a, a large housing development or its own city, we want to keep as much of the microgrids or the overall grid powered. But if you're still removed from a utility or maybe down the road there's not a utility in the utilities, it's let's say the one making all the decisions. The individual microgrids need a way to communicate to each other and say, here's how much power I can provide. Uh, maybe here's how much I, I want to be paid for it if I am producing it. Or um, here's how much load I need to add. Can, can you give me more? And there, there would start to be a, a real, let's say, futuristic way to start to have the, the microgrids communicate to each other. And maybe that's through a centralized entity like a utility, or maybe that's even peer-to-peer uh, -peer or direct. Uh, you get a little blurry because there's a transmission line that's owned by somebody else in between there. But I think as microgrids develop in the future and they all have the ability to operate on their own, they can communicate in a way that actually makes all of them more stable together. Okay. And that stability and the frequency are both important for, for ECO. Um, when, but when we do start doing things like shrinking down the, to island to, you know, bite size uh, grids, um, that problem seems like it would be simpler and simpler to handle, and maybe the, like the idea of spinning reserves. Um, how, how, do you happen to know how much Heco spins where they have to keep it online and going, just in case they, they get hit by a big surge? I'm not sure what the, the number of the spinning reserve in, but I, I would guess that they plan on at least one of their large engines dropping and then at least picking up that. I would guess they they have a, a fairly large drop in solar at the same time, 30, 40, 50 percent, which is, as you get that spending reserve, you, you take a real big hit on efficiency alone right. just, just to keep that available. Mm -hmm. Engines are just more efficient when, when they reach their, uh, their full load. So, I mean, so going back to where we started, where you have line losses and you have spinning reserves. So if you started basically what I would call being more efficient with your electricity by maybe not pushing it through as long a line and having your, your self-sustaining communities make the energy, uh, make the power right where they need it. Um, between that and having a more predictable load in these microgrids, because maybe it's only houses, maybe it's only a residential community, mm -hmm. that has a whole different surge profile than Campbell Industrial Park, mm -hmm. where you have big motors and things kicking off and, and stuff. And, and you have more distributed energy sources. So if one solar panel or one house drops offline, it's like not a big deal compared to one generator dropping off the HECO's line is a, is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So automatically, I mean, if you're talking like even 30% of a spinning reserve and what, 10% line loss or something, I don't know what the number would be, but we're, we're talking 40% of the oil that we're burning to make electricity is just we're burning it just in case. Yeah, we are burning it for a stability or a, um, yeah, a just in case. A quality thing for the grid, because HECO's contract with the people is clean, steady power that's there all the time. Yep. So a microgrid can change that to be a little more detailed per the client. A microgrid could say, 
what do you want to keep online for, for how long? Or can you suffer some outages briefly so that we can be more efficient on, on the, the HECO side? So a microgrid could gain you the capabilities. Instead of increasing generation, we could decrease load. And, and that is something that a microgrid could do if, if you set up, let's say, the, the politics or the control system to, mm -hmm. to require that. So if a whole community got together, like a, a, an organized community association got together and made a decision that 150, 200 houses and all the people in there agreed that it was worth doing, um, you know, they'd hire a company like your company or, or, or ideally I think they'd, it'd be great to work with Hawaiian Electric and Hawaiian mm -hmm. Electric should have a, a group of engineers that would help a community uh, do that. Why? Because it's more efficient for HECO too. Yep. You know, it could actually help them out and, and help them uh, with their stabilization issues and they wouldn't be wasting as much power or burning as much oil to supply that community and still provide a service and still keep linemen employed and still keep technicians employed and engineers employed mm -hmm. to help that community service itself and keep it going. Pretty reasonable? Yeah, it absolutely is. I think the utility model as today being a little more centralized will change to where the utility is, is almost there's still going to be a large facilitator and uh, between microgrids, but there will be essentially a, a HECO microgrid for a community mm -hmm. of houses, and, and there will be an agreement with how they want to operate to just be a lot more control against all of Oahu mm -hmm. operating in at, at the same fashion. Mm -hmm. and, and all that will equate to more efficiency and uh, make the goal to achieve the 100% the renewable that much uh, more achievable. Okay. Well, I know you've only been here eight months in, in, the, in the state, but um, you're pretty familiar with the neighbor islands as well, right? Mm -hmm. And our, our biggest load uh, in terms of um, need for power is here on Oahu with all the, I mean, all I have to do is fly in on an airline and look at what's built up down around Honolulu, and you, you know the biggest draw of power is, is sitting right here. It's not on Molokai. And so we, we have this issue where the big power requirements are on Oahu, but a lot of the renewable capability is on the neighbor islands, and we've had discussions within the state of running an underwater cable, which at the last time that I was involved in that, it was $800 million to run an underwater <laughs> cable between the islands and things like that. Mm -hmm. it, what are some of your thoughts on how feasible it is to move energy between the islands, and maybe what's a more efficient way than pushing it through a cable? When I moved here, I thought the islands were, were interconnected, and when I found out they weren't, I was actually quite surprised. Um, I think it is still a, a good plan if you can do it because it's going to give you a lot more energy security as a whole. Uh, a hurricane may hit Big Island that doesn't hit Oahu or vice versa and you can support each other with your generation efforts through uh, via subsea cables. Um, I don't know the cost of it today. Um, love to look into that and, and find out what it is. But the nice thing about subsea cables too is um, there's a, a level of t protection mm -hmm. being being subsea, and the, the temperature alone is actually going to help you out with your losses. Okay. So you will see some loss, but we're not um, likely, not quite my realm. But you'd probably up the voltage extremely high, or even switch over to DC mm -hmm. to. To push over um, between the islands, but I was gonna, I was gonna ask that. I was gonna go, you know, is there an advantage to DC versus AC when you start talking distance? You have to up the voltage on the DC extremely high to help reduce the the um, losses of the line. So typical DC will will at any voltage we're used to using actually will have a lot of loss because the current needs to go out and needs to come back. Right. So it's going almost twice as far. You need to move the electrons. In AC, we're just moving them back and forth, so we're moving them in a very short distance. So DC, when you get to extremely high voltages, then you can start to see some gains. Not, not nothing I've been uh, used to working with, but I know that that's where you start to see the flip over mm. where um, DC will be advantageous. Okay, what, at, at about, I mean, we're at what, on Oahu, um, 900 megawatt ish mm -hmm. is that about oahu's i think so yeah right around there so if if we're getting i mean what's a, what's a good megawatt you know like trade-off so if, if the big island had had um, geothermal or if um 
Lanai and Maui want, wanted to put more wind power up or had more geo, or had geothermal because I'm sure they do too mm -hmm. um, and push some of that what kind of power could we really get efficiently um, from Maui say from Maui County from Maui it wouldn't be that bad it's, it's really not that far over there um, I would imagine you could get just as much everything that they're able to give you if you build that cable right you'd be able to it, it'd be the substation interface where we put that on on our Oahu uh, being just geographically constrained on what's available and how mm -hmm. you do that mm -hmm. um, will be probably more of a limitation is what you put on the ends but the cable oh, okay. we can we can build out to to move a lot of the power back and forth okay yeah because I know we looked at that several years ago and it actually had some momentum for a while but it, and it kind of died off so uh, maybe maybe it's worth looking at again I don't know how about doing my favorite thing which would be maybe liquid hydrogen or hydrogen and transporting, actually transporting a gas. Yeah, transporting a gas uh, via pipeline, mm -hmm. I assume. Um, pipelines do get a little bit of a, a bad rap on on their on the oil side, where, where we see a leak. Uh, if you see a leak in a in a gas pipeline or a, a hydrogen, if that being a clean mm -hmm. gas, I don't know that anybody's. Yeah, it's non poisonous. To... It's yeah, it's pretty benign in terms of uh, if, it, if it leaked out, it, it leaks out. Mm -hmm. It'll make some more clouds or something, but <laughs> yeah. it, it won't, won't really do any damage to the environment. Sure, but the, the technology is there to, to have the, the subsea pipelines. They, they exist probably more than people are willing to, to admit to right now um, in other okay. parts of the world. You know, maybe we'll have to look at that. We'll, we'll do some more homework together, and we'll, and we'll yeah. talk about that on a future show, I think. Yeah. But um, so... You know, right now you're working a lot on on Hickam with uh, the National Guard and and Birds and Mac and with us with at each cap. What what's one of the most exciting things you you've kind of learned or figured out helping to do the pearl microgrid at Hickam? The probably the most fun part about the pearl microgrid would be just the amount of energy security we're able to bake into a very clever design that we have that and. To not go for another half hour on, on just that, but we have created a, a smart grid within our within our microgrid. I, the smart part is uh, it's kind of a little cliche, but we can suffer any single point of failure throughout the system, whether that's a fault on a line, a loss in communication, a, a break in a fiber line, a, a power supply to a single relay. We are bypassing intelligently around any single point of failure to reestablish power to the to the macro the microgrid as a whole so we can reroute power any direction to to rebuild within a very short amount of time and that's all happening automatically yeah, i'm glad you said that because that's exactly what our objective was, <laughs> was to basically make doing. it make the energy security a, a premium there and make it really really doable well, we're pretty much run out of time here, so we're we're up against our our ending. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Ryan, for thanks for, for being having on the me. show today. And I think we're going to have to have you back a little bit more often to explain some of the the details on uh, on what Hawaii can do to to have a cleaner energy future. Yeah. So we'll have you back on on a show sometime, and we'll, we'll do some more talking. Thanks, I'd love to. Anyway, thanks for joining us this week on Stand Energy Man. Until next Friday, actually next Friday, I think I'm going to have Rachel come on. And, and take my place. So if you like Rachel, tune in next Friday. She's great. Aloha.